This is Bible Academy. I'm pastor and teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in the book of Romans, chapter 8. We will continue at verse 31 after our review. Now before we get started, as always, we need to make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are controlled with the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege and opportunity that we have to study your word. We ask that our hearts and our minds will be open to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go back at the review at the point of verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Because whom he foreknew, these he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that his Son would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Well, the next section, Paul opens with two questions. Nothing that is unusual. We've seen this before. Paul asks a couple of questions. Sometimes he answers them immediately. And sometimes he'll give a long answer, which is what we have this time, after the two questions. And this goes with the background of what we just read about what God has done for, the, for us. Verse 31, here are the two questions. <clears throat> what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? The first question, what then shall we say to these things? These things would be the things we've seen in the last several chapters that have come up uh, again and again, such as justification, hope, suffering, perseverance, Christ as our sacrifice, salvation from wrath, reconciliation, grace, life through Christ, our identification with Christ, union with Christ, freedom from sin, sanctification, eternal life, newness of life, no condemnation for those who are in Christ, walking in accordance to the Spirit, thinking on the things of the Spirit, the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. Living or led by the Spirit. In the realm of the Spirit. We are children of God. Adopted sons of God. Heirs of God. Fellow heirs with Christ. Then he comes back to the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We have the first fruits of the Spirit, with more to come, including redemption of the body. We learn of the Spirit interceding for us, all things working together for good, predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, called, then again we looked at justified and glorified. Now this is a pretty long list, and if you studied through these things with me, you have got a good uh, chunk, I might say, of Bible doctrine. Bible truth that every Christian should know. And I am a little hesitant to say this, but how often do you get this type of teaching in your local church? It should be regularly. This is the meat of the Word. And if you're going to grow, these are the things we need to know. Unfortunately, so many churches do not teach the Bible like they should. Now, of course, that's between them and God. 
but at the same time we are to be discerning and if you want to grow these are the things you need to know and learn to apply God wants you to think the Word of God so you can apply it and live like his son and if we're going to think and live like his son we have to know the mind of God and this is what he has revealed to us these important truths and this is just from a few chapters in Romans now with this list of things and there was more but I wanted to hit kind of the highlights and things that should uh, uh, things that should remind us uh, of the things we we spend our time on and again I use the word things Paul asked this question what then shall we say to these things all these things we've learned that God has done for us here's the next question if God is for us who is against us with all those things God has done for us who could be against us now listen God himself is the only one who has the power and the authority to bring any charge against us but look what in fact he was done he has done for us all these other wonderful things based upon the fact that he sent his own son who not unwillingly died for us so if we know that God is not going to be against us proven over and over again by the wonderful things he's done for us who or what could Verse 32 goes on to elaborate. Indeed, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Paul's argument is simple. He didn't spare his own son, the son that belonged to him, the closest one, in relationship his own not adopted that's what we are but his own son gave him up for us all God did this he gave Jesus up to the crucifixion he had him go for go to the cross that was part of his plan that was his will for Jesus and Jesus willingly did it he did it for us all all of us, those of us who hear this, believers, we are the ones who should appreciate this. So here's the logic. If God the Father gave up his own son for you, for me, for all of us believers, it's like a conditional sentence here, if God did that, then the last part of the verse how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Notice with him. Christ has been given for us. If he's given us the most, how will he not give us the lesser things, all things that's left? This is simple reasoning. If God gave us his own son, the most valuable thing he could give us, how will he not follow it with many, though less valuable things, they are free and wonderful? And all these things, the list we saw, have been given to us, and many, many more. Now another important point. These things have come. Many of them we already have. And there's a lot more to come. And knowing that God was willing to have his own son sacrifice for us should leave us without a doubt that these other things are coming. I suppose if we knew some of the eternal uh, rewards and blessings that we would see we, we would receive we might 
be very well distracted from our responsibilities still left here on earth. But what we know, and what we need to know, God has already told us. They are freely given and they are wonderful things that we will receive in the future after we get done with our task here on earth. Now, the next two verses, Paul again asks questions. This time, challenging the thinking that someone might want to charge a believer and him somehow lose his justification. Romans 8, 33. <clears throat> Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. The first question, who will bring a charge? Future, active, indicative. In kaleo, it means to accuse, to bring a charge against. The quick answer, God is the one who justifies. Now, listen to this. Notice, God's elect. Who would bring a charge against God's own people? Believers. The quick answer, God is the one who justifies. If God has justified them, who could possibly bring a charge against them? He's already justified the believer. Nothing or no one has the grounds or the power to accuse or charge the believer of anything that would condemn him. Now, this is not to say that there aren't uh, unbelievers in this world and there aren't, uh, of course, demons and, of course, Satan himself who might uh, accuse us before God regarding our sin and our life. But God has already justified us. So he really has no grounds at all. Now we've learned in the previous section that God has in effect already conformed the believer to Christ's image and glorified him. That was one of the points we saw in the Romans 8 passage where we ended before we started this lesson. That we are considered already glorified. In fact, it's stated as if it's happened in the past. With that done, let me put it this way, with that done deal, there is no charge and no sentence to be passed. Believers are already in a state of justification. When it says God is the one who justifies, that reminds us of believers being justified, declared righteous before God. So Paul continues to build his case, we might say, with another question, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? All right, we just saw that God is the one who justifies. If someone is to charge, would it be God? No, he's the one who justifies. How about condemning? Here it is. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. And more than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also is interceding for us. So the question is, who is the one who condemns? It couldn't be Christ. He's the one who died for us. So the question and answer continues the thought of who would bring a charge, but now it's, who is the one who condemns? We have a two-part answer. But before the answers, don't miss the logic. Who condemns? It cannot be Christ. He's the one who died for us. Now we look at the two-part answer. First, justification. Christ, Jesus, it's in brackets because there's some question about whether this is in the original or not. It's difficult to determine. Uh, it doesn't look like it was, though it sounds like it, it could fit easily, but it doesn't look like it was. But because it's one of those borderline calls on textual criticism, you put it in and you see it really has no effect on the passage. Christ Jesus is he who died, and more than that, he was raised. Christ died and made it possible for us to be justified. He's certainly not going to be the one that condemns. Now see, 
you would say that as God also at the right hand sharing the rule with the Father would he condemn us? Not at all. He's the one that paid the price and that price removed any penalty that might fall on us. Furthermore, he was raised. His victory was complete over death and sin. And that leads us to the next answer. Remember I said it's a two-part answer here? It's beginning to be described as who is at the right hand of God. Now listen. Let's go back to the previous verse. Who has a charge? It could not be God. He justified. Who condemns? It's not Christ. He's the one who died. Not only that, he was raised. And now he's at the right hand. Here's the rest of the answer. Christ is in the position of authority. Um, we might say, uh, technically, as a vice region of the Father. He shares authority with the Father. In other words, the same Jesus who died for us is now sharing rule with the Father. Is the one who died for us going to let any charges stand when he personally paid the price for us? Of course not. Then, it is in this most powerful position as ruler over the universe that Christ intercedes for us. Let's put this on the board and make sure we get this down. First of all, <clears throat> who, I'm going to write it all down, but who would bring a charge against us? Who would condemn us? Not God, not Christ. Of course, this is God the Father, not Christ. Why wouldn't God the Father? He's the one who justified it, justified us. Why not Christ? He's the one who died for us. And together, they sit in the most powerful position as ruler and judge. And if they're not going to do it, there's no one left to do it. Not only that, but Christ prays for us. He intercedes for us. If there's an issue, he goes to the Father. We've already seen the Spirit intercedes for us. So you got all three members of the Godhead saying, you're justified, you're not condemned, and now we have the Son and the Spirit praying for us. So the Trinity is on our side. Nothing or no one can stand against us. The word for interceding, into Kano, to pray, to entreat on behalf of another. Whatever possible accusations might be thrown at the believer, Christ is there to step up, to step in, and defend us. The very one who died for us is there to provide our defense through intercession for us as believers. So, Let's do some points. Who is the one who condemns? One. It is not Christ. He is the one who died for us and, secure, and secured our justification. He secured our justification. <clears throat> Number two. As he was raised to life, so also we, by trusting in him, have life, spiritual life, not eternal death or condemnation. 
Listen to John 11.25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. A third point. Christ, now at the right hand of the Father, the most powerful position as ruler of the universe over all creation, in this highest of positions, also speaks on our behalf. He is our defense, our advocate, who intercedes for us. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Let me read that again. Therefore, he is able to save completely, referring to Christ, of course, those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Christ lives to intercede for us. That's one of his duties, you might say, one of his uh, things he does on our behalf. Well, these two verses in the judicial argument, we might call it, why there's no legal condemnation, why there's no charge, as we see that God doesn't charge us, Jesus doesn't condemn us, and we move to a more personal defense of the believer because of the relationship that we have with Christ and his love for us. So now Paul goes to a more personal defense based upon the relationship we have with Christ. So we move away from the legal terms and move into the personal aspect of our defense. So Paul asked it from this point of view. He asked another question, a couple of them. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? You see, Paul views believers as locked in with Christ because of the great love he has shown for us and continues to show for us. Don't forget that. Christ loves you dearly. Then Paul begins to make a list of things that could possibly, uh, that people might say, that possibly might separate you from a loved one Keep that in mind. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the God-man who sits at the right hand of the Father. Who can separate us from his love? Or what can separate us from his love? Now, Paul's going to list a bunch of what's here. And I want us to look at them. And I want to put them in a way where they look like a list, which is what they are. The first one. Let's look at the word, actually, let's look at the word separate first. Corizo. It means to divide. Who can divide us from Christ? Future active indicative. Who can do that? And then he lists actually some things. Tribulation. Philipsis. Affliction or oppression. The next one. Distress. Stena, Stena, Korea. It means anguish, stressful circumstances. Or persecution, Diagmas, designed harassment. The next one, or famine. Limas, lack of food or hunger.
or nakedness, gymnotes or notes, gymnotes, lack of clothing or lack of adequate clothing, destitution. Or peril, can do nos, danger or risk. Keep that term in mind, can do nos. Uh, that's translated here, peril. It involves risk or danger. Because we're going to come back to that several times. Can do nos. And the last one, or sword. Makaira, an instrument of death that provides both the threat and the power of death. Now that's Paul's list here in Romans. And if we were to look at the other list that Paul writes of his own personal experience, we will see that several of them are listed in this list we just saw in Romans. Which means that perhaps Paul was reflecting back on his own life and some of the things that he has went through as an apostle. Let's look at a couple of lists of Paul's personal dangers. We'll go to 2 Corinthians 11.26. And I will also break up the verse so it looks like a list. Again, which it is, but we're going to do it a little differently this way. I think you'll find it effective. 2 Corinthians 11.26 Paul writes... I have, con I have been constantly on the move. Now, if you know anything about the life of Paul, you've heard of his first and his second and his third missionary journeys. And these went over a, a period of years. Paul was constantly on the move. He wasn't one to settle in one place very long. We know that in but it was Ephesus. He was there for some two years. But if you were to say you moved every two years, I think most people would say, well, you really don't stay very long in anywhere, any place, do you? Well, with Paul, as we know the stories, sometimes he'd get run out of town. Uh, sometimes it might be the authorities or it might be the uh, uh, religious people. Uh, his own countrymen would run him out of town. But Paul was one who did not settle down because that wasn't his mission. But at the same time, as he spoke the word and spoke the truth, people would go after him. But it wasn't just people. It was natural disasters that he had to face. Let's look at the list. Verse 26 again, I have been constantly on the move. I have been and danger from rivers. Now the word danger is the word I pointed out earlier, can do nos, it means risk. We translated it peril in verse 35. Here we're translating it danger. So the point is there is risk. His life is in peril. It's under threat. Alright? Now, let me ask you, how many times has your life been threatened? And you've had to flee. Or you've had to hide. Or you've just had to deal with it. Listen to Paul's list. In danger from rivers, that's natural disaster. In danger from bandits, the criminal element. In danger from my fellow Jews, his own countrymen, men like himself, who would turn on him. In danger from Gentiles, people outside of his, his uh, customs, his, his uh, countrymen. In danger in the city, people went after him in the urban and populated areas. In danger in the country, this word also means 
desert or wilderness. This is the rural areas. Paul wasn't safe there either. In danger at sea. So he goes out on the water. He's not safe either. He goes through at least three shipwrecks that we're up, we're of. And in danger from false believers. Those who pretend to be Christians. Oh, what I could say about that. Between the people who pretend to be Christians, who think they're Christians, and those who are baby Christians, those can be some of the most, uh, what should I say, persecuting type of people. Because they don't know anything. And often they think they're doing God's will, when in fact they're working for Satan. Let's look at verse 27 as this verse. Or this passage continues in 2 Corinthians. I have labored and toiled. He's worked. He's worked at his job. He's done his studies. He's, he's worked at his uh, tent making. Trying to make ends meet. And have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. That means not having proper clothing. Now the first question probably comes to your mind, well I thought God took care of the Apostle Paul. Well, to give you a short answer, this is how God takes care of his own. Sometimes he doesn't provide what we would consider basic needs because it's not in his will. It's part of the testing. It's part of the growth. It's part of the endurance and the perseverance. And it's not easy. Now, having been in the pastorate a number of years and, and uh, basically been, been run out of some of those because I taught the word, I look at this list and think, I know what that's like. I've never went really hungry or thirsty for very long. Uh, I've been in bad areas of town where there was always a criminal element. I could give you a list and compare it, but I'm nothing like this. I don't know who could compare themselves to Paul. But the point is, we need to understand that those in ministry who are faithful are often persecuted and have to deal with the world, the devil's world, the cosmos diabolicus. And God will keep his hand on us, but at the same time, we can go through a lot. Let's look at one more short list in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. And I wanted you to see the context here a little bit. Verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. This is when Paul had prayed for that thorn in the flesh to be taken away. His answer, God's answer, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Weakness. When you feel inadequate, when you feel sick, when you feel like you can't make ends meet, when you feel like you're not strong enough, God's grace is sufficient. Those times when he didn't go without sleep, not enough to eat, perhaps thirsty out in the wilderness, being exposed to the weather and the cold, Paul knows, as he says here, God tells him his grace is sufficient in those times of weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Just barely sometimes feeling like you're holding together. Verse 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in 
insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties for when I am weak then I am strong there are times when I read these verses when I go over them and I study them and I think, well now, how should I communicate this? And as I go over them, perhaps the first or second time, I start my own applications towards myself first. And as I said, though my list would not compare to Paul's, I've had my hardships, I've had my insults, and my persecutions and my difficulties and I still do for when I am weak then I am strong sometimes when you feel like you're at your ends you've just got to lay down and you can't go on you know that Jesus Christ is there to provide his power is there now you may be thinking, I wish he'd give me a lot more. But that's not his will at the time. You trust him even though you feel like there's just sort of a thin string by which you're hanging in there. That's part of the test. Now some might argue, well, what about all this prosperity and health and, and good things God gives his people? Well, that's only part of the package. The growth package includes hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. And as you grow spiritually, you'll begin to get some of those. Those of you who have already made a stand and had to deal with your family members, perhaps a spouse, your parents, relatives, those you were raised around, those you used to visit on the holidays, now you found yourself more at odds with them, difficult to be around, because you can't really discuss the most important things in your heart and in your mind because not only would they be offended, but you would not see them again. So you have to gauge what you say carefully regarding the gospel regarding Christ. I'm not saying to stand down, not at all. But I'm saying it's different. They don't think like you do anymore. Perhaps it's obvious they don't live like you. You don't engage in the things you used to as a family member. You don't play the games. You don't do those things they like to do, whatever that may be. Because you're growing in Christ and that includes being insulted and persecuted, being talked about behind your back, not getting what you know you were supposed to get. The, the list is endless. About the only one mentioned here that's mentioned in a Romans passage that Paul didn't experience is the sword, which he would, meaning the Somehow he would die by some sort of instrument. Back to our Romans passage. At this point, Paul breaks off the flow of this passage to begin an Old Testament quote. Listen to this. He quotes from Psalm 44, 22. Romans 8, 36. Just as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now some of your translations won't actually put the word killed in, but that's what it means. And they'll take it metaphorically, threatened. But at the same time, uh, the people of Israel were killed by the enemy. Listen to uh, we'll go to Psalm 44. Let me give you a little bit of background. Psalm 44 is a community lament psalm. If you recall what we've done in the Psalms, there were times when the community would cry out to God 
and a psalm together. In other words, it's a prayer of the people as a whole. We don't know the exact occasion in Psalm 44, but they went through some sort of devastating defeat. Now, after listing the great things and ways God has given them and victory in the past, the psalmist writes of the particular situation they're in now. The occasion for this psalm. All right, let me say that again. After writing about the great things that God has done for them in the past, the victories they've had, the psalmist comes back to their present situation. Listen to this. Let's do 9 through 14. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy, and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep, and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for repentance, gaining nothing from their sale. You have made us a reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations. The peoples shake their heads at us. Now the psalm goes on to speak of uh, the faithfulness of the people. But the Lord is allowing this great suffering. And now our verse, that's one that's quoted, verse 22 of Psalm 44. Yet for your sake we are killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That's quite a statement. God allowing his people to die. Now, to bring us in perspective, of what Paul is saying back to our verse I'll put it back on the board for your sake we are killed all day long people are going after us some of us are dying for the faith we're viewed as no more than sheep to be slaughtered I think this is what Paul is trying to do he's trying to say the extreme here is going on. We're being martyred. There are believers who are being martyred for their faith. Verse 37. But in all these things we have total victory through him who loved us. The key word here. Total victory. We have total victory. Huper nekao. Nekao is our word for victory. Huper, over and above. Uh, sort of like super victory. To gain a surpassing victory. Prevail completely. Even with all of this going on, we have total victory through him who loved us. Referring back to Christ and his love in verse 35. It is through Christ we have more than a victory. We have a complete and total victory. I don't care how tough things get. I don't care how bad you feel. How much of a crisis you have to deal with your family, your health, your nation. You have complete victory over all those dangers and adversities. And we've also learned they work together for good. Now Paul expands. Listen to verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor angelic rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
nor powers. Let's just stop there. We'll continue the list, but I want us to look at this. Notice, for I am convinced. Paul writes, for I am convinced. Paul is personally and totally persuaded of what he's about to say. Now he's going to list several contrasting pairs to show that nothing can separate the believer from the love of Christ. These are all used in rather general ways to express the different ranges of things. Let me get it back up on the board. First of all, he says, neither death nor life. No matter how or when or where or in what manner, whether it be a peaceful death in bed or being blown apart in an explosion, what happens when the spirit departs the body is not an issue. Nothing in life, either good or bad, whatever happens, again, Nothing specific here. That's the idea. Nothing will separate us from the love which is in God, of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What I want to do here, before we continue, is read verses 38 and 39 together. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor angelic rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, verse 38, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now let's go back to where we were. Neither life, neither death, nor life. Again, nothing in life, nothing in death, however it occurs, whatever manner, will separate us from the love of God. Nothing in life, good or bad, whatever happens. Paul writes in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The next contrasting pair, nor angels, nor angelic rulers. Now the word for angelic rulers is RK. Basically that word just means ruler or authority. But as we have it here in this context, I understand it to refer to the angelic powers. Whether it be the high ranking angels or just the rank and file. This, of course, refers to the unseen spirit world of angels, holy and fallen, all the devil and what the demons can do, whatever they can muster up, cannot have an effect on God's love for you. Nor things present, nor things to come, nothing in current time or in the future, no length of time, and separate us from God's love. Nor powers. We don't have a contrasting here. I don't know how you would do that. Would, what would you say? Non-power? So Paul doesn't list a contrast here or a pair with it. The point is there is no power or authority in existence that can do it. And then verse 39, we continue the list. I can put that up there. Nor height nor depth without any specifics. This could refer to anything under the earth or above the earth. The pit of hell to the heights of the heavens. It also implies distance. No matter how far. We might say from the east to the west, from the north to the south. None of those distances can create a separation between God's love for you. And what he how he loves you in Christ, nor any other created thing. Now this is an interesting one. 
the word created thing, something created, a creature. No creature outside of the believer himself could threaten his love from God. Now, let me look at this phrase. Let's look at this phrase. Nor any other created thing. Uh, that would mean any other human, any other creature. Angels would fall in that category. But notice, other created thing, just as it's translated. The believer is one created thing, a human. The other created thing would, some, would be something other than the believer. Will be able to separate us from the love of God. There's our word carizo. It means to divide, to separate. Carizo. C-H-O-R-I-Z-O. -O. Long O's on that. This love from God. And this love from God is qualified as, and let me put the phrase up there, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here we see again the height of God's love in Christ Jesus. He gave him for us, and it is in Christ Jesus that God's love for us is secure. This chapter ends with Christ Jesus mentioned again. You might not have noticed, but if you go back to the end and look at the last two verses in chapter 4, and the last verse in chapter 5, 6, and 7, they end with the mention of the person or work of Christ. So, this chapter 8. Five chapters in a row comes back to the person of Christ, showing us how Paul's writing is centered on the person of Christ. <clears throat> Let's look at our last few verses as we close. We'll begin at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us who is against us? Indeed, he, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. And more than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also is interceding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Notice these questions, verse 31, 30, uh, 33, 34, verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we have total victory through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor angelic rulers nor angels nor angelic rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your wonderful word. Thank you for the challenges you have presented us. We ask now that in the power of your spirit, we might not only learn these things, but begin to apply them in our lives. Lord, you have given us so many things. And help us realize your tremendous love for us. Help us serve you faithfully, no matter how bad things get. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.